And we are live, and it's a special edition of Crypto Law. Hello, everyone. I'm John Deaton, the founder and your host here at Crypto Law TV. So the big news today is that yesterday, the SEC's request for certification to file an interlocutory appeal to the Second Circuit was denied. And um, before we get into it, um, it's a little bit of validation because, as you know, I've been arguing with lots of other lawyers out there for the last three years. But to me, this was a no brainer. In fact, it was a prediction that I put out uh, right when this request went down. I think we have a, a, a tweet of it. Uh, let's see if we pull it up. There you go. So on August 17th. I said she was going to grant the right to file the motion, but now she can deny it and explain why she's denying it, along with explaining why Rakoff and that whole terraform was off. And, and the whole big nothing burger, as far as I was concerned, where everybody was saying that the Rakoff decision was inconsistent with her decision and everybody was throwing rain on the parade of her decision. And we're going to talk about that. But before we do that, I said a long time ago, we're talking about within the first four months of the case being filed, which is almost three years ago, there was a lot of debate because people were talking about the fact you know, that Judge Torres was an Obama appointee and a Democrat and all of that. And I said, look, I look, I've done the research on this judge and we got lucky and we got lucky with Netburn. And I think I put that up there. And this is a tweet going back to 2022 in April, where I said exactly how I always feel, which is we as XRP holders, and, and that includes Ripple, got lucky by the draw of judge that we got. I believed very confidently that Judge Torres and Judge Netburn would follow the law, would follow the law. And that's exactly what she did. Now, when she followed the law, she got criticized for following the law because all she did was apply the Howey test to the different categories of sales that the SEC claimed were violating Section 5 of the 1934 Securities Act. And she applied that test to each one and gave her decision. And people jumped up and they said, oh, it's inconsistent with the policy and all that. And we went all over all that. But this motion was big. And it was a colossal mistake by the SEC again, which I'm going to explain. But let's first talk about what uh, the standard is of an interlocutory appeal. Basically, the judge laid it out. Here's her first, uh, the page of her decision that came down last night. So everybody knows what we're talking about. And, and now it comes down to really three things. For the SEC, and, and I practically guaranteed that she was going to deny this motion. And you're going to see why I was so confident here in a second. But basically, there, there's three things that she looks at. The first one is, if we pull it up, is one, the issue before the judge must be a pure question of law that could be decided quickly and cleanly without having to study the record. That's the first thing, right? Now, what's the second prong of the test? Okay, is that there's substantial ground for difference of opinions. That's what the SEC was claiming. And then finally, the third prong of the test is that the, the interlocutory appeal should basically advance the termination of the litigation. Okay, so when we talk about controlling law, basically the judge said, look, SEC, you said time and time again that the Howey test is a fact and circumstances test and that a judge takes that how he tests and applies it to the facts of the case. And that's the decision. So that first prong on an, on an interlocutory appeal is that the appellate court needs to just look at the issue of law and shouldn't have to look at the evidence that was presented. And so when you go through this masterful opinion, 
And, and before I do that, let me tell you why it was a colossal mistake. Because before yesterday's decision, all we had was a summary judgment ruling by Judge Torres. And when you have a ruling, different lawyers can differently interpret it, right? So, for example, the industry uh, basically said, well, Judge Torres was saying that you can't have uh, an investment contract on an exchange when it's sold on an exchange. People were interpreting it that way right? Because they wanted it to be that way. That's good for Coinbase. That's good for all of crypto. And the SEC was interpreting it that way. I kept saying she just applied the facts of the case. And she even said in her summary judgment decision that there are XRP holders out there who did buy XRP expecting a profit. And they might have relied on the efforts of Ripple. She said that in her decision. She just said, but the SEC hasn't proven that. And she held the SEC to its burden. And that's all she said. So she acknowledged that. But when we just have her decision, it's open to debate. What did she really mean when she said X, Y, Z? Did she really mean X, Y, Z? Or did she mean something else? And so without the interlocutory appeal, they could take it up to the Second Circuit and debate what she meant. But now we have a second ruling a decision by her that explains in detail why she ruled the way she ruled. So there is no interpretation anymore. None. She told us exactly, and she did exactly what I had hoped she was going to do and others had hoped that she was going to do. I'm not the only one out there. There were others who were saying the same thing, and she bolstered her previous decision. And I'm telling you, Trust me, she made it untouchable as far as I'm concerned, and she made it bulletproof because she basically said on the interlocutory appeal, that first prong, you can't look at this without looking at the facts. And here's some of the things that she said. She said, for example, that the appellate court must review the record. She said, quote, that she extensively uh, reviewed the factual record, which is heavily disputed by the parties, and she reviewed very detailed expert reports. She brought out the fact that the SEC alone, not counting Ripple, the SEC alone had 1,600 purported facts that they were citing that she reviewed, many of which were disputed by Ripple. The SEC, in its summary judgment, put forward 900 exhibits. When you count Ripple's exhibits, which included XRP holder affidavits that we gave, it was almost 2,000 exhibits that she reviewed. And she reviewed all that to come up with her answer. And so that's why it's bulletproof. She explained it. In fact, she laid out what she reviewed on, if you go to page seven, she laid out of things that she reviewed and relied on. And there it is. And I've highlighted for you number four, but we'll go through them real quick. She talks about how programmatic buyers could not have known that their payments were going uh, to Ripple because they didn't know who it was. She relied on the fact that less than 1% of all XRP cells are Ripple cells on exchanges. Um, she stated how Ripple made no promises or offers because they didn't know who was buying XRP. And number four is highlighted because that's our affidavits that was cited in her first decision, many programmatic buyers were entirely aware of Ripple's existence. So if you're on an exchange and you're buying XRP on Coinbase or Uphold, you don't even know who Ripple is as a company. You're just buying this asset. Then even if you have an expectation of profit, right? So you can buy XRP. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. You can buy XRP and expect a profit. That doesn't mean you're expecting it from Ripple. And that's where Gensler got smacked down. And I believe it's in a footnote where she discusses um, this very issue. Okay. 
And there, there you have it, footnote five. While she's saying, a, a, let's say an XRP buyer sees the price of XRP dramatically increase, right? And they buy it and they're hoping that it's going to keep going up. So they're clearly expecting a profit. So, but that motive, as she says here, was not derived by the efforts of Ripple. It's just someone who's a day trader, right? Think about that Ripple case where the person was a day trader and there was a class action suit. This footnote destroys them because it's how can you rely on the efforts of Ripple if you're just trading XRP? Oh, it's going up. I think it's, it's up 4%. I think it might go up to 10%. I'm going to try to get a little profit. You are expecting a profit. According to Gary Gensler, that's a security because you bought it on an exchange expecting a profit. Judge Torres smacked, smacked them down uh, and said, no, an expectation of profit alone is not. And so you have to have that expectation derived by the uh, efforts of Ripple. And there was no evidence of this. And so she went through that. Um, and she, she goes in her decision to say the core of the SEC's claim is that the court improperly applied the Howey test to the facts. In other words, she was saying, you just don't like the answer, right? I did what you wanted me to do. I did what I'm required to do. You just don't like the result. And so she went on and, 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 and did all those things. And, uh, and then we get to that second part where it's, it's going to have uh, it's disputed. And that's where the terraform case came up. And remember how everyone made a big deal about that terraform judge, Rakoff, saying, I'm not going to follow the Torres reasoning. And if you recall, I even talked to Charlie Gasparino about this on the uh, with him and Ellie. And I said, it's a nothing burger, man. It, her decision isn't even inconsistent with Rakoff. Ladies and gentlemen, do you know how masterful Judge Torres handled this? I'm telling you, it's beautiful. She doesn't even name Judge Rakoff. She talks about the case. And you want to know what she says? She basically says in so many words that she would have done the same thing that Rakoff did. She just says, listen. And then she goes into it and says, that was a motion to dismiss. And a motion to dismiss a judge must must assume that all of the allegations offered and made by the SEC are true. And if you go to the complaint of that case, it said, it said that the marketing efforts of Do Kwan and, and the entrepreneurs promoted to the world that you buy Luna, it's going to go back into the profit and everybody's going to make a profit and that it reached the secondary markets. That's what it, so the judge Rakoff was required to assume that. And she said, fine, basically that's a good decision because you have to assume that. So then she said something that isn't so great for the rest of the crypto world and it shows you that XRP is really protected and isolated here because she said, I never said, nor did I ever imply that it's impossible for uh, a, a token sold on an exchange to not be a security. She basically said, yes. It's possible you can come up with a factual scenario where someone buying a token on an exchange is also a security in the secondary market. If, like in Terraform, the marketing reached the general public. She said here in the Ripple case, there's no evidence of that. In fact, if you go back to our amicus brief, we highlight this incredibly well, in my opinion. I know I'm pat myself on the back a little bit, but I'm telling you where we bring out the fact that one of the things the SEC was relying on was a tweet by Chris Larson in 2014. I pointed out to the court that none of the six XRP holders that are named in the amicus and in the motion to intervene, not one of them 
was even on Twitter in 2014. How would they know what Chris Larson tweeted in 2014? Yet they bought XRP. It's got nothing to do with us. There was a, a brochure that went to 100 investors that Ripple sent in 2014. We made the point in our brief, well, pursue those 100 people. Maybe they, maybe they bought XRP and maybe they relied on what Ripple said in the brochure, but there's no proof that that brochure ever reached the public. And so Judge Torres, again and again in this decision, says all the things that the SEC is claiming don't apply to this case. Then masterfully, she handles the library case because the SEC said, look, there's this inconsistency. Look what the judge in library did compared to you, judge. First, she says, that's in a different circuit. But guess what? In that case, the first and second prongs of the Howey test were not contested. And she cites that. And she says, since there was no, con they weren't contesting the investment prong, then that rationale by the judge or the common enterprise prong, and in the Ripple case, they're contesting it all, that that's like comparing different sports. She can't rely on something that wasn't litigated. So it, it means nothing. And then she says the SEC has failed to cite a single case that leads her to believe that this case should go up uh, to uh, an early appeal, if you will. So those are the, uh, the highlights. I think we had one other footnote to highlight. Uh, I don't know if I got to it. Did we have one more? There we go. And this is just an example I wanted to show you of, of her smacking down the SEC. As you can see there, I'm not going to read the whole thing. She's talking about how uh, the SEC has presented shifting and inconsistent arguments uh, as to its legal theory about other distributions. The other distributions is where XRP was, was given in a grant or it was given to someone and the SEC, at one day, day they claimed it, it was this. And the next day argument, they claimed it was that. And the bottom line is she said, I didn't say that there wasn't ever a time when you, uh, uh, a, a person could give tokens to someone without money and it could still be an investment contract. She said, I didn't say that that could never happen. Of course it could happen. In this case, in this case, there's no evidence offered by the SEC that meets the Howey test as it relates to those. And so basically what she did is said, all I said is XRP is not a security. And all I said, applying all of the evidence and all of the expert reports and all of the facts that sales on exchanges to XRP holders like you and me don't satisfy the Howey test in this case. And when, I, when you go through this second decision and you compare it to the first decision, I'm telling you, there's no appellate court that's going to come down and say, no, you got it wrong, judge. You got it wrong because they would have to examine 900 exhibits offered by the SEC. They'd have to examine a thousand exhibits offered by Ripple and they'd have to go through 15 expert reports. They're not going to do all that. The question here is, did she apply the Howey test in a fair and reasonable manner. She did. The SEC lost. Too bad. So sad. Get away from us crying. All right. That's basically what you're doing. You're not used to losing. Get used to it, at least in crypto, hopefully. So now that's what the, the decision, the, the last page, you know, is where we at now. This is the last page of the decision and it lays out where we're going next. So she denied the interlocutory appeal. That means in April, we have a trial. And that trial is of Brad Garlinghouse and Chris Larson. And that trial is scheduled for April 23rd at 9 a.m. in New York. And she says, by December 4th, the party shall submit any motions in limine. And by the oppositions to those motions must be filed December 18th. Okay, now... 
what's the impact? The impact on this decision, it's great for Ripple. It's great for XRP holders. It's not bad for crypto in general. The judge, But the judge did say that she never said that a token couldn't be a security sold on exchange. It just wasn't XRP. And so maybe she took a little bit of the wind out of the sails of all the other tokens saying, no, it equally, this decision equally applies to me as well. Basically, Judge Torres says, no, it's a fact and circumstances. And she beautifully dismissed that whole argument by the SEC because she said, all those other cases you're citing deal with different digital assets, with different entrepreneurs and companies, with different facts and circumstances. And so what that unfortunately means for crypto is that we're back to this case by case specific analysis, right? There's not this general uh, rule that's laid out there that says, hey, blind bid asks as a matter of law are not um, investment contracts. We want that, but that's not the case. And this decision last night basically narrowed this just to be an XRP kind of story. You can still, if you're Coinbase, if you're still, if you're Algo, if you're still of any of these other tokens, you can use this case beautifully for your defense. But there's not this sweeping precedential value that people were hoping that would apply equally, you know, to all tokens. And so, uh, unfortunately, until Congress acts, or hopefully we get a decision in the Coinbase case from Judge Felia, maybe she will agree that in a blind bid ask, at least with those tokens on Coinbase, that as a matter of law, how he doesn't apply. I would rule that way, and but I'm not the judge. If she rules that way, then it is the biggest victory crypto could have. We're going to wait and see. We're going to see that decision in the not-too-distant future. And so that's where we are. I believe we're at the point now where we're going to take some questions. And I know my team put some questions. Oh, there's Jungle, right? So what is the most logical step for the SEC? Will Gary Gensler just keep pushing a losing battle? Okay. Great question, Jungle. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your support and everybody else. I think the next logical step, obviously, is a trial. But when we talk about that trial, who has the leverage? Ripple, Brad Garlinghouse, Chris Larson have the leverage. The SEC doesn't want to try this case. I pointed out earlier that, you know, if the SEC lawyers – could own and trade XRP up until March of 2019, if they could, without any restrictions, as an SEC enforcement lawyer, how could Brad Garlinghouse, who's not an SEC enforcement lawyer, who hasn't been schooled in Howie like they have, how could he be reckless, right? Not just negligent, but reckless, uh, in 2015, if in 2018, the experts could own XRP. And so when you think about that, when you think about the Hinman speech and you think about Hinman potentially testifying and the drama that that would be, I called it an epic cross-examination where I said I would offer my services free of charge because it would be so damn fun. Um, the SEC doesn't want that. So the next logical step, Jungle, would be they either dismiss the case against the two executives and then they just move forward with the remedies section and they argue over does Ripple owe $750 million or do they owe $100 million or what's in between? Um, do they try the case, which I don't think so, or do they come to the table now and say, listen, you know, we have this trial hanging over your head and let's settle. If I'm Brad Garlinghouse's lawyer, I'm not letting that be leverage. I'm saying, no, we want our trial. So you can dismiss us. That's your choice. But we don't view that as a bargaining chip because I would rather have the trial than you would. And so I think they're at a place now where they're talking right now and somebody at the SEC is saying dismiss this case 
uh, we cannot waste our time trying this. We're going to lose. And you have to ask yourself if they honestly believe they're going to lose, that they can't get a verdict against Brad and Chris, then why go through it? Why not? You have right now a 770 million judgment, you know, on its face that Ripple's going to challenge and try to reduce and will reduce. But that's a pretty significant thing. And so I don't think we're ever going to see the trial, but I could be wrong. Uh, when politics are in play jungle, all bets are off. I thought that Gary Gensler could already have had a huge victory by settling this case. He hasn't. And that's because when politics are involved, all reason goes out the window. And so what is Elizabeth Warren and her anti-crypto campaign in an election year and her anti-crypto army? What's their stance? How aggressive are they pursuing Coinbase? How can they settle with Ripple and still pursue Coinbase? Can they thread the needle? So we're going to find out, uh, and we're certainly going to find out come December 4th when these uh, motions have to be filed. What's the next question? Can the SEC appeal Judge Torres' whole ruling? Well, yes, after the trial's over. So they could dismiss the case right now against Brad and Chris because they think they're going to lose. They then would go into a remedies hearing with the judge. Remember in the library case after the summary judgment, at first, uh, the SEC wanted $22 million, and then after there was discovery and some hearings and interrogatories were served on each side, they realized that they didn't have the money, and they settled on $110,000. $22 million to $110,000. Ripple would be trying to pursue something similar, $770 million to $200 million or less. Who knows? So, um, but... After that remedy section's over, then the case could go up to appeal and the SEC could have a full appeal. But they damaged their chances of winning significantly by going the interlocutory appeal route. That's what I meant by colossal blunder. The judge now, her ruling is not open to interpretation. Her ruling last night explained her decision completely. And in my opinion, no appellate court is going to touch it. Now, the bad news, and I think uh, Scott Chamberlain, I said he had a, the best tweet on this. Uh, he tweeted something out where uh, he basically said, this isn't going to reach the Supreme Court. Um, I think that was the one he was talking about. Yes, it also means the Supreme Court is less likely a destination uh, because this was tied to the facts of this case. And so if it's tied to the facts of this case, you know, are they really going to challenge? Now, the library decision where they are appealing it and they are invoking the major questions doctrine on appeal, uh, the judge in the library case said, oh, well, you didn't argue that that's too late. But that doesn't mean it's too late on appeal. So that one could reach. But is the SEC going to appeal this decision to the appellate court now that the interlocutory appeal has been denied and she's explained it so much, drastically reducing the chances of success? And so what Scott was saying is we're not likely to get a ripple test, as a lot of people had predicted. The good news is this is the law of the land. This appeal being denied guarantees that this is the law of the land up until 2026 and the chances of it being overturned in my opinion are slim to none and therefore will always be the law of the land that's my personal opinion what's the next question explain the limiting motion and december 4th and 18th deadline also can ripple request him in or steven they are off testimony all right great questions you guys are always great and i can handle that together a motion in limine is basically when the one side comes to the court and says, we want an early ruling on something. Let me give you an example. In my asbestos cases, there's a document that one of the companies that I sue for my clients, uh, a document by one of their executives wrote the following. The document says, you know, my answer to the asbestos problem is this. If you made a good living from asbestos, you might as well die from it. Now, in, 
a plaintiff's attorney, what we call that is a M effort document. It makes the jury go mother, right? That this company put profits over life and they have that kind of disregard for human life. Well, the defendant always files a motion to eliminate to the judge that says, hey, judge, we want this document excluded. We don't want Deaton bringing this up in his opening statement. And we don't want the jury to ever hear or read this document because it's so inflammatory. It was just one person's, you know, opinion. Ever hear that? One person's opinion at the company, at the SEC, and we want you to exclude it now. So the second part of that question was about Hinman. We could see on December 4th a motion from the SEC saying, judge, we want you to exclude any reference to the speech. We want you to exclude um, any of the drafts of the speech, the emails where they talked about uh, don't say ETH, regulatory gap, um, Hinman called it the ether speech. That would be one of the motions in Lemonade that could be filed, along with others. Ripple could file motions in Lemonade that they want their clients, you know, names not disclosed or whatever. It's just that's what a motion in limine really is is about. Okay. And then the the December 4th is when each side files their motions in limine. And then the December 18th is the other side's response to the each side's motion in limine. Do we have any more? I know we're running up on time. I believe that the institutional sales issue is separate from Brad and Chris's case. Is that so? And when can banks expect to have clarity on uh, how or where to buy tokens? Um, the, the only thing for trial, Ripple has already been found liable with institutional sales. The question is simply, is Brad or Chris reckless when, and, and if they're reckless, that means they ate it and abetted Ripple in making those institutional sales that were securities. That's the only issue before the trial and for a jury. As far as when a bank or institutions will be comfortable, I can't really answer that. I can tell you this, that financial institutions in the United States don't like any bit of a cloud. They, they are conservative, right? It's just like exchanges delisting XRP just because the SEC claimed it. So it could be a situation where they won't, won't use XRP until there's a hundred percent clarity, meaning there's no more appeals and is, or there's a settlement and a settlement is disclosed. And a lot of people are asking why would Brad Garling house settle on behalf of Ripple. And that's the answer. If they came to Brad Garlinghouse and said, look, you pay this amount of money and we'll agree uh, that all future sales of XRP, no matter who sells them, are not securities. And, you know, we're not going to stay in the way of your IPO. I'm pretty sure with that kind of certainty moving forward in life, where you can only work worry about adoption and growing your business and you don't have to worry about any of this other stuff. I think that's worth quite a bit. And, and so uh, until we have that, maybe banks and institutions won't be comfortable. Anything else? Or was that it? Can the ruling play into Coinbase's reply in this motion uh, to dismiss? Well, the Coinbase made their motion to dismiss and now the, uh, SECs filed an opposition and they can reply. And that's what this person, great question, is asking. And I think that this ruling is going to be a little difficult for the lawyers at Coinbase to cite as a great reference, right? This particular ruling, because before this, she has made it more tailored to the facts of this case in XRP and Ripple. And she said that it's possible, but uh, they're very talented attorneys. Um, and, and I'm sure that they're going to find something in this decision that will help them. I'm confident, as you know, I've uh, interviewed uh, their chief legal officer, brilliant guy, um, smarter than me. They'll find a way to... Uh, to use it somehow in their favor. I'm, I'm confident. Uh, I can't think of it off the top of my head right now, so I'm not going to try to
come up with something. But I'm sure it's there. That's what they get paid for. Anything else? I don't believe so. I think that's it. So listen, just want to have this is great news. The bottom line is XRP uh, not being a security is the law of the land and will remain the law of the land for the very, very foreseeable future, as in at least two or three years, if not forever. And I think that we're getting closer to where the SEC is going to be forced to pivot to come to the table. But we'll see. Until then, see you next time.